Welcome to the Creativity, Thinking, and Education podcast with your host, Patricia Rose Upsack. Today, we have the amazing and wonderful Holly Corby, who is going to be talking to us about all kinds of interesting things in education and in the world of media. Good morning, Holly. Good morning, Patricia. Thank you for having me. Well, we're just thrilled. Um, would you do me a favor and tell our audience a little bit about your background? Because it's really quite extraordinary for somebody as young as you are. Oh, well, that's really sweet. And I am not as young as you might think. Oh, yes, yeah, you um, are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a journalist, and um, I write mostly about education and parenting issues. And I write for the New York Times. Uh, the Atlantic. Um, I've done some work for Medium uh, for their education channel that's called Bright. Um, And I've also, you know, written some essays on parenting for a couple of books. But my my main gig is I'm a regular contributor on education for NPR's MindShift blog, which is um, run out of sister station KQED in San Francisco. And MindShift is, uh, is about the future of education. The tagline is how we will learn. So a lot of our work centers on trying to figure out solutions uh, for things for how kids will will learn in the future. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, before we get into this too far, I would really like to have you um, give our audiences some way to, um, do you have a website or can they find you on MindShift or where, something so that if they wanted to send you a question or something like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I have a website that's hollycorby.com, and my last name is K-O-R-B-E-Y. So mm-hmm. hollycorby.com, and my email address is on there if you want to shoot okay. me a question or even an idea. I love getting ideas uh, for stories. Oh, from- good. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So when we first talked, I was really very impressed by the breadth of your knowledge and the diversity of the things that you're interested in in education, um, which I think really is wonderful. And right off the bat, it occurred to me that um, you and I had talked and you were, you're writing a book. I am working on a book right now. Yes. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, absolutely. I, the book is about Waldorf education and the ways in which we can take um, the research-backed pieces of Waldorf and plug it into regular schools. And so what I argue in the book is that we don't need to keep this philosophy in a Waldorf school, that, uh, you know, the arts, um, that, you know, they're really strong in the arts, and they're really strong in kind of open-ended play. We can take pieces of this um, philosophy that works so well and plug it into traditional schools and really improve a lot of what's going on there. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait to read it. Do you, well, have, do you have any titles that you're thinking about putting to this book? I can't say any of them right now. <laughs> yeah, we've been really <laughs> working on it, but I can't say. That's okay. Um, okay, so um, in in a perfect world, what would public education look like to you? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I mean, just, it's just your opinion. And this is not putting you on the hot seat. I promise. I just want to know from, because you are involved in a variety of education and types and you've seen a lot of different programs. What, what do you, if you could sit down and design um, a public school program to make children and young adults happier, what would it be? Well, I, I think that I would, Um, definitely make more options available to kids. And I think that this is probably my number one thing is that the, I, I would want to include lots of arts and I would want to include lots of play. And I'll tell you why that's because if you're not there, well, there are many reasons, Um, but one of the big ones is if you're not so great at reading and math, especially to start with, um, it gives you something else to be good at. And one of the things that I love about handwork, like let's say woodworking class, is that that might give you a chance to shine in an area where you're not shining in an academic area so much. And what has happened is we have narrowed the focus in public schools so much 
to these purely academic pursuits and at really young grades too, that if you're not good at those, man, it's so hard to go to school. Right, right. And it also sets up a mindset that says, I'm not good at anything in school. Well, that's a really great point. Yeah, school isn't for me because I'm not a math person. Right. And one of the great benefits of making um, lots of, putting lots of arts in, into a school is that it gives you chance to explore. You know, maybe I'm good at dance. Maybe I'm good at theater. Maybe I'm good at, and so then it kind of get, can get you through those academic subjects because you have something to look forward to. You know, it's like recess. <laughs> yeah. I have three sons and you always say, what's your favorite class? They all say, Jim. <laughs> But that's okay. That's good. You know, because yeah. there there are kids though that hate gym, you know, that, that really right. have they struggle for gym, but but they love art or they love music. You know, it's the um it it's interesting how because uh, for I taught for twenty three years in um Boulder, Colorado in a big high school and I started a program for learning disabled high school kids because back in the day they used to think that um because it was a long time ago, but kids, they thought that kids sort of outgrew everything, you know, and if they outgrew it, if they outgrew learning disabilities and they didn't have to put them into high school programs. And so there weren't any in Colorado. And so I started the first one in Boulder. And um, very quickly, I discovered that a lot of my students were very bright, but they had what you called, um, it was like splinter skills. They'd be really good at one thing and terrible at something else. And oftentimes it was like maybe they were great at math, but they were awful in reading and, and terrible at writing and different things. You know, I mean, there was never, they were never great all the way across the board of something. Um, but a lot of them were very creative. A lot of them were really good in art or they were amazing singers. I mean, it wasn't unusual for me to have, um, the school had a program called, um, they had two programs that were, well, they had a huge drama program that was amazing, but they also had a huge music program that was amazing. And, um, and, and it wasn't unusual for my students to be in both of those and be in, they had like levels of groups and Mm. these kids would be in the top groups. I mean, there were some of, some of these boys would have voices, that would just make you cry. They were so good. I mean, they could sing and they could play music, musical instruments. And, and then they were also in the art classes. They, they drew and painted and were like professionals. I would be in such, such a state of shock Mm. and then realized that, you know, a lot of times that's what kept, they would, you know, they would show up for school so that they could go play basketball or so that they could be on the baseball team and, or they could do whatever. Um, not because school was easy for them. It wasn't easy for them, but they, they really got something out of being there. And so they stayed. And that's one of the things that really concerns me is when people talk about, um, the dropout rate, that's because we are not giving the kids a reason to be there. Because if you give them a reason to be there, they will they will show up and they will stay. If it's a safe place like it should be, they go. I mean, it's I there used to be some kids that would come to my class. I mean, it's like they would come to my class and then they would um, go back, get, go into the regular mainstream all day long, and they'd just have me once a day unless there yeah. was some kind of emergency. But there were some kids even though the school itself was rel- can't, had a, a relatively affluent population, there were kids that weren't. And so they would, a lot of them would show up to school hungry. So I kept a lot of breakfast foods in yeah. my classroom. I had a refrigerator and the whole thing. And, and when they would, they would come early and I would just say, if you're hungry, here's something. And they would scarf it down. So a lot mm-hmm. of times for those kids, getting breakfast and then they would get free lunch, getting breakfast and having lunch at school was a reason to show up. I mean, it, you know, I know that sounds silly, but that's all we really have to do in education is to give kids a reason to be there and they will learn and they will, they will start to develop and blossom. And that's what I want schools to do for both the teachers and the kids is to allow them to grow and blossom in a way that they absolutely can. Well, absolutely. But, you know, I think that that requires kind of a holistic view of uh, of our children as whole people. And, you know, what when you're talking <laughs> about this, when you're talking about this, I mean, it makes me think of all the research, like, let's say the kids who live for music, you know, that there's all this research that music more than any other activity benefits your brain in these unbelievable ways. Um, playing an instrument 
you know, increases your spatial skills. It increases your language skills. It increases how this different sides of your brain talk to each other. Musicians have been known to be better problem solvers and more creative problem solvers. So there's, there are all these academic reasons to play music. But here's the lowdown is that, you know, there is a researcher who found that music at school makes kids happy. Ah. And so kids who play music at school are happier. And my logical thinking goes, happier kids do their homework. Happier <laughs> kids do what teachers ask them to do. Absolutely. And so it's kind of like we we want everything to have an academic reason that, you know, we need a reason for doing it. But until we consider the whole person, I mean, I think your example of breakfast is just perfect. That if we can just get the kids there for whatever it is that right. gets them there, and right. then we, we got them in a situation where they can learn right. <laughs> whether they like it or not. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that, the, and the, you know, you hear a lot of people who say, I mean, lots of kids in this country go to school hungry, you know, yeah. and I'm I'm sorry, it might sound like I'm being um, rude, but there isn't any reason, any reason why any child in this, this country should go to school hungry. I don't care what anyone says. Somebody should be able to turn that around, you know, just... With, I mean, you can you see people focus on all kinds of things all over the place, and and then to have kids not be able to focus because they they're hungry, you know, or they're they're scared, or there's some environment is not safe. I mean, it's I don't just I just don't understand how a school can't be a safe, healthy environment for children. I just don't. I think that that should be a huge priority in this country and in the world. Well, and you know, like the the our local neighborhood school is really, I mean, and, and we have a very good public school. It has a very diverse population, but they've turned into almost a community center. Uh -huh. And I, yeah. what you're talking about is what we're doing, which is they have a, um, a place you can go shopping for clothes. Uh -huh. So you can get your uniform clothes. You can also get winter coats there. We have a food pantry that is incredible. Uh -huh. Um, and laundry detergent, food, whatever. We offer free breakfast and free lunch for everyone across the board. And then we also are adding medical services. Uh -huh. So there's a dental truck that comes and you get free teeth cleanings. You get a free physical. So I think that maybe I hope that schools are responding to this need that you, you see. Oh, right. Yeah. It's by we're kind of, you know, making the community center at school for kids. Well, and the thing is, the other thing that I actually see that that we used to do years ago and, and that they have talked about, but I haven't seen them do very much of it up, up here. Actually, the elementary school and the junior high school and the high school up here in, in the mountains is wonderful. I mean, it's an amazing school and the people and the teachers and the kids and everyone works very hard and they include art and music and PE and all kinds of things. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a good community kind of school that's, you know, cause it's a small community. But, um, but one of the things I also think is really a very positive program. And I know that they've been trying to do it in certain places is um, having senior citizens go into not just elementary schools, but also go in to high schools and sit down and maybe mentor or teach chess to kids and do all kinds of things because there are a lot of people at that end of the scale who have a lot of talents and wisdom and ability to share with younger people and the, the younger people might listen to them because they're not related to them. That's really an interesting thought. And I think that it, also goes back to what we're saying is kind of like giving kids as many opportunities yes, to learn right. different things as we possibly can. And I feel like what I see when I go into classrooms is not that. I see an almost like a dogged, unrelenting focus mm -hmm, on writing right. skills and math skills without considering the other factors that help you learn those skills. And I mean, I think like learning from an older person or learning a special skill from an older person absolutely falls in that category, just right. like music and art do. It's actually not a luxury. You know, we usually say that the kids who, you know, are falling behind the most in the schools where there's a low SES population and kids have a lot of problems, that they're the last ones to receive all this great extra stuff. 
Oh, right. Be- yeah. Because it's considered a luxury when the research is showing us that the opposite is the case. Right. That the more of these interesting, open ended opportunities they get, the better they do. Absolutely. Now, can we just get, now, can we just get all the schools to listen to us, Patricia? <laughs> I mean, we're solving some problems here. I think that we could solve a lot of problems. We'll have to come up with a title for this about, you know, the possibilities for the future of schools or something like that. Because because the thing is, is, you know, I have talked to a lot of people who are involved in or who care about education, and they're all saying the same thing. So Mm -hmm. somebody is not listening. Yeah. I know. And it's, you know, it's a lot of times it's our state politicians. <laughs> well, it is, you know, and, and that's too bad because the people that they're impacting, except for the teachers, because they're also impacting the teachers negatively. Because, you know, I watched a lot of incredible teachers work day and night to help their students. They cared so much about what happened to those kids. And, and you know, to it makes me so sad to see how a lot of them, really good teachers, have, you know, just either gotten out of education or they're they're trying so hard to to hang in there, but it's turned the whole testing thing has turned their jobs into not teaching what they should be teaching, but teaching so that they can do well on the tests, and that's wrong. It is wrong, and uh, so uh, an, uh, a piece that I'm working on for MindShift uh, got me into seven first grade classrooms here in Nashville last week. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So it was it was so eye opening because I got to go to all different kinds of schools and talk to all different kinds of teachers. One hundred percent of them are the kind of teacher that you're talking about who so cares about the students. Oh, yeah. Like teaching as if their hair is on fire. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. Like intense, so much devotion. Right. One teacher, we ended up after school getting into this huge conversation. And I said, Man, I, I gotta I gotta ask, how much open ended playtime do these first graders get? They're six and seven years old. Right. And she looked at me and said, Zero minutes in a week. Oh. And she said, It is she said, I'm ashamed to tell you that. Mm-hmm. Right. But what am I going to do in order to cover everything they're asking me to cover? Um, you know. That there's literally no time. And she showed me a secret box she had of paints and craft supplies. And she <laughs> said, sometimes, I'm not kidding. This isn't really. She said, sometimes if we can hurry up and finish and get our goal for the day, I'll whip this out and let everybody paint a picture really quick just so they have something. And I just thought, oh, my, this is so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because because the thing is, is that. You know, I um, one of the one of the um, podcasts we have is uh, Dr. Polly Palmer, and she she did a lot of research on um, the Finnish schools and Dr. and uh, what is it, Sir Kenneth Robinson, and all those people. Yeah. And and um, and her podcast is actually fascinating, and and it it just went live um, yesterday. But one of the things that she talks about is um, that what she feels makes the Finnish schools. Um, so much more productive in terms of, you know, the test scores is that's not their goal. Their goal is like what you were talking about, treating the whole child um, and that they're always trying to figure out ways that they can do better at what they're trying to do. They're always working on, um, you know, if they see a child starting to fall behind, they, they seem to pull together rather quickly to help, those kids they you know and it and it's not um it's not a political issue and it's not a competition or a race it's about helping kids um become educated adults that you know have you ever read anything by daniel pink oh yeah mm-hmm. i love daniel pink and he's such he's such a nice man and um, and I keep trying to get him on the podcast and he said, well, let me finish this book first. Well, it's going to take him nine months to finish the book. So it'll be sometime <laughs> next year, but that's okay. But, um, you know, he, his, in one of his books, I think it's called, um, the whole brain or something like that. It's, he, he really talks about wh- how important story is and how important, like learning how to become a, a well-rounded, um, young adult, 
you know, that that's really the goal. The goal isn't um, to have good test scores. I know people who are extraordinary and they couldn't get good test scores, you know, if their life depended on it, you know, they just couldn't. And, and yet, you know, anyway, so if anyone's listening and they want to read Daniel Pink, they should. (laughs) Okay. So we have, um, we have like a few minutes left. What, what is, what's your passion? What do you really want to talk about? If, if we could get lots of people to listen to this podcast, what do you want them to know? Um, I think that what I want them to know is I want, I don't know, I, I want parents and educators together to think about how they can incorporate more arts into their kids' lives, period. And I think that there is, it's a passion of mine. I grew up in a musical family. So music and theater are a huge part of my life. Um, my parents were amateur musicians and we had a family band. And Oh, I love it. <laughs> my degree is in musical theater and I went on to perform. I was in a Broadway national tour. I worked in New York as a, as an actress for seven years. Wow. Okay. And, um, my own kids all play. I have three sons. They all play instruments. Music is just a huge part of my life. And so I'm always trying to think of ways <laughs> and through my writing that we can make it more practical. Uh huh. Right for people to get some arts into their life. Because I think a lot of people think, well, I'm not an art person or, or a teacher would think, well, I'm not a good singer. Uh So that doesn't make any sense for me, but I feel like that there are ways and you know, that, uh, you know, that what I love about the Waldorf school, which is why I'm writing about it is because musicalness is a part of every day. So they open every day with a song, you know, they sing a verse like Mm -hmm. a good morning verse and they sing a cleanup verse. This doesn't just end in first grade though. So my son who's in the eighth grade is still singing. Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. They they get in a circle, they sing poems, they sing uh, traditional folk songs, they play rudimentary instruments. You know, it's not expensive to get some flutes for your class or some drums or some tambourines. Uh And I feel like if we could make it a part of, you know, a lot of music teachers because of this pressure from many states, I've heard a lot of music teachers say, oh, we teach literacy in music class. You're going to be learning literacy (laughs) in music. Well, I always say when people tell me this, well, then can we put music into literacy class, please? <laughs> That's a good do, idea. Let's go both ways. Right, right. Um, that that's wonderful. So, um, okay, well, that's that's a good passion. So, um, I'm interested. Actually, you you've written for the New York Times. Can you want to tell us a little bit about what you write for the New York Times? Oh, sure. Well, I write more, um, I write about schools from a parenting angle for the Motherload blog. Um, And I've written a couple of pieces for them. And um, the biggest one, the one I got the biggest response on was, should preschoolers have homework? So um, I had been hearing from a lot of parents who I knew around the country through social media, right? which, which, by the way, is the best way to talk about education stuff. Um, Anyone can find me on Facebook. I'm Holly Corby. Come and find me. Um, Is that uh, preschoolers were coming home with worksheets. Oh, yeah, that's wrong. (laughs) It's wrong. You know, it's plain wrong. But, of course, you know, you can't say that. You have to really support it with a lot of evidence. (laughs) So you're just see, you're just you're you're a lot more, you know, calm, cool and collected than I am. There were times (laughs) I would go into the school and go, this is wrong. (laughs) Should my four-year-old be doing worksheets? Right, but exactly. Patricia, you would be shocked. So I went to a couple of local preschools here, like church preschools, you know, like in the basement, a bunch of really wonderful people. And they all told me something that shocked me, which is, well, we don't want to do this, but the parents want it. Oh, no, you're kidding. Well, because parents feel a tremendous amount of pressure for their kids to be ready for kindergarten. And they get Aww. very nervous if their kids, because I don't know if you've taken a look at what skills are being asked of kids to upon entry to kindergarten. It's, oh, it's awful. It's no, absurd. It is. It is absurd. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But And so that's how you get, 
you know, preschool saying, well, I guess we, we need to start working on skills with four-year-olds. And of course, I went to every expert for the article and they all said, what the heck? No, of course you should do that. <laughs> Well, and so the thing is, is that, you know, the other thing that's a huge problem in education is the amount of stress that um, the teachers, the students, and and probably the administrators and the parents all feel. And there has to be a way of reducing that stress because, I, you know, the thing is, is education, and these kids are our future. I mean, it's it's not, it's really important that that they enjoy school, you know, and it makes me really sad when I see um, kids that are like in the thir- second and third and fourth grade that love school. And then as they go up into the higher grades, they really don't, they don't mm-hmm. like it at all. And it makes me really sad because, you know, as feisty as I was growing up, I loved going to school. I mean, I did, you know, it's now I'm not sure the nuns were very happy about having me around, but, but, you know, they weren't always nice to me, but, you know, I was the kid that raised my hand and say, are you sure about that? (laughs) (laughs) But what I will say is I was in an environment where I could say that and then, and 99% of the teachers would respond to my question. They didn't Mm -hmm. say what a stupid question. They didn't say anything negative. You know, it was always, you know, I think you and I had talked about um, when I was a teacher in the high school, um, one of the things we had was that that every so often, even if you were a seasoned teacher, you had to go find somebody that taught something different than you did and watch them teach. And Mm -hmm. I went to... um, to the math department and I watched um, Jim Shepherds who was the head of the math department teach his class and it, I think it was geometry or something and I'm sat sitting in the back of the class and I watch him and he's explaining he's writing it out on the board he's talking about it they have worksheets and he's explaining um, some theorem and um, and he had done a, an amazing job and then this little girl about halfway back in the class raised her hand and she said I'm sorry Mr. Shepherds I still don't get it Instead of getting upset or tense and saying, well, how could you not get it? I just explained it three different ways. He said, maybe I didn't explain it right. Let's try a different way. Mm -hmm. And then I realized why he was a master teacher and why students did so well in his class. It was because there was no judgment on having wrong answers. It was, let me try a different way of explaining it. He was really teaching. He was really allowing them to not understand and not feel bad about that. And I thought that was really so, so wonderful. I mean, I really did. And it's always stayed with me as a wonderful example for teachers everywhere, because I think, I think most teachers care deeply about helping the kids learn and, and they don't go into education for the big money and all of the things that some people seem to think they do for heaven's sake. So, you know, I feel like that a lot of this might have to do with pressure And I really feel like that in order to change what you're talking about, that we it will require a cultural shift that as Americans, we may not have. And I'm going to get a little negative here for a minute. (laughs) um, You only have a minute to be negative. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, Okay. So going back to I talked to this wonderful man named Tim Walker. He has a blog. He's an American teacher. Uh He taught in Boston for a long time who married a Finnish woman, and now he's teaching in a Finnish public school. And he's keeping a blog, and he writes some articles for The Atlantic about it, about the differences uh-huh. between the Finnish school system and the American school system, and it is fascinating. What Now, and what's his name again? His name is Tim Walker, a, W-A-L-K-E-R, okay. like I'm walking. Right. Um, and he, uh, he said, I, I got him, I emailed him, because I'm writing this story about first grade, and Finnish first graders only go to school for four hours a day. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And most of them, their parents work. So they stay at school and they have these after school clubs. And during after school clubs, there's like music and art and open ended play. But the after school club lasts like three and a half hours. And he said the most marked difference to him when he first got to Finnish schools was that no one is stressed out. And he said they don't want stress for themselves. The teachers don't want to be stressed out. And they don't want the children to be stressed out. And he said it's a it's a cultural thing. Ah. And 
and I, you know, when you just think of Americans, you think kind of, sometimes I get the idea that Americans want to be stressed out. <laughs> oh, I don't think they do. But I don't yeah. think that, that most of us know how not to be. I think that that actually requires a, a shift and a focus that I think if most of Americans knew how to do it, I think they would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I hope you're right. I, I do. Well, you, you're just wonderful. And maybe sometime in 2017, I will get you to come back because you really are exactly what I'm looking for on this podcast. You're amazing. Thank you so much, Holly. So you have like 30 seconds to say anything you want, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay, Patricia, thank you so much. I'll come back anytime. This has been such an intelligent discussion. I would love to do it again. Thank well, you. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me here at the Creativity, Thinking, and Education podcast. Please visit us at happyteachershappystudents.com. And if you find value in this podcast and the message that we are trying to spread, then click the subscribe button and give my show a review, hopefully a good one. I am very, I'm so excited to be able to share the timeless awareness of so many interesting people with you. Thank you.